and uh, I'm going to talk on fire, but it's fire too. I spoke about fire some uh, weeks, perhaps a month ago, and uh, I'm going to continue on, so I'll just give a little uh, overview of what I spoke about last time, and I just want to add to that, because some events have been happening in this place, and I believe God is lining us up for revival. Amen. Now, we might have to... Uh, uh, perhaps think about getting a bigger church and uh, planting another church and having this one going because we don't want a big church syndrome. We'd rather plant churches and, and grow that way and have other people uh, used in that particular area to lead and to guide. But the important thing is you and I are bridging this huge valley or a, 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 a chasm and it's roaring. It's, a, it's the community. It's roaring with indifference. We put the next slide. Indifference, hostility, um, persecution, skepticism, it's all there. We're being attacked left, right and centre, not only from people in the street that you work with as well, but also our politicians passing bad laws. And they're emitting those things themselves, bad laws that they're passing, which will persecute Christians and it will only damage the people who it's supposed to be protecting. So, and ridicule, the last one, is something that's really happening uh, uh, as far as we're concerned and the, the Christian message. And I suppose one of the things I left you with last time with, with is that you choose today to have either fire or retire in your desire. Remember that? Yes. It's so weak I made it up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you, you choose fire or you retire. You can either be zealous for God Amen. or else you can be pathetic for God. And we're going to look at some of those things. I don't know about you, but I want to be on fire. Amen. I don't want to be zealous I want to be more than zealous. Amen. I want to be overflowing with the power of God without being a weirdo. All right? So that's important too, because otherwise nobody comes to God if they think that you're a weirdo. We can't be weirdos. Jesus was not a weirdo, and all the people said. Amen. He did the miracles and the signs and wonders, and people were astounded. Well, I went through last time. Um, you can write it down, but don't turn to it. We haven't got the scripture up there. It's Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, where Jesus told them to go and make disciples and he said baptize them we're going to do that today teach them and the scriptures teach us not to be just hearers of the word but to be hearers and enjoyers of the word but doers doers of the word we need to do stuff we need to get out there uh, it talks about in James chapter 1 verse 22 and Matthew 4 verse 4 it says we don't live by bread alone but by every word. that proceeds <laughs> So we're not living by every word because there's also this absolute rubbish out there. Every, every conspiracy theory you can imagine, you just pick it and you run with it. No, no, we're, we're not interested in that. We're interested in the word that comes out of God's mouth and all the people said. Something really, really important. Now, I can't say too much, otherwise I won't get part through the part two of this. So praise God. All right, fire. You know, John the Baptist, remember I spoke about him? And he came along on the scene and he said, I'll baptize you. And he said, uh, in, the, in the Holy Spirit and fire. And he said, he'd thoroughly clean out um, and, and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And he said he'd gather his wheat into the, into the barn. And we, I springboarded from that and I went into Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And we sing that song. There's another in the fire walking next to me. There's another in the water holding back the sea. Go something like that, right? Now, Demi and I were practicing that at home, right? We had our three grandsons. They were there. And they were listening to us, and we were uh, making mistakes and everything, but we got this rhythm going. It was really great. And then I took my three grandsons for a walk through the park, not f from where we were. And suddenly, they all broke out into song, singing those words. Do you know how much you influence your kids and grandchildren? If you are atheistic or ashamed of your faith, they will be atheistic, they will copy you. They will be ashamed of their faith as well. We need to be shouters for God, not over the top, but enthusiastic for the things of God that we have because the ridicule is there, the indifference, the hostility, the persecution, the skepticism, but we know it's true, the word of God. Now, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm just going to read this scripture. I want you to just relate to this scripture, if I can find it, in my Bible here. Ezekiel chapter 1, and it's really amazing. And this is the God we believe in. You know, people love religion, and they, they're involved in all sorts of ceremonies and all this stuff. And, okay, that's up their, their lot. 
But behind all this, what originated all this is perhaps this is the power of God. It's in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4, and I looked, Ezekiel looked, and behold, a stormy wind came up out of the north, and a great cloud with a fire enveloping it, and flashing continually. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst of it, it seemed like it glowed uh, amber metal, and out of the midst of it, fire. Can you say fire? We believe in a fire God, okay? A fire God. A God whose fire, he cleanses us. He cleanses, he burns up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Enthusiasm needs the fire of God inside of us. Otherwise, you'll never be enthusiastic. Fire does something. And it says, and out of the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, or uh, cherubim, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And of course, the scripture goes on. You're well, you've read this many times. It talks about um, what they saw, what Ezekiel saw. He said, The likeness of their faces, each had a face of a man in front, and the four had a face of a lion on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four also had the face of an eagle. Now, I'm not going to preach on that because they'll take the rest of the time. Amazing characteristics of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is pointing to those scriptures and those books in that particular vision. But the amazing thing is they appeared like a man. Can you say like a man? Like a man. Now, what amazed me, if you go over to verse 26, it says, And above the firmament, firmament, there it is, that was over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. So now we're looking at the throne of God. In appearance, like a sapphire stone, and seated above the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man. Okay? Isn't it amazing? It says that we're made in God's image in his likeness. Isn't it amazing when the deity came down, when God came down in the form of Jesus, as he appeared as a man? All the characteristics there, he knows exactly where we're coming from, where we're going to, how we're tempted. Everything that we go through, he knows because we're made in his image and his likeness. I don't know about you, but that excited me when I read that the other night. And I thought, well, that is amazing what God's teaching us through these things. Well, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego went through the fire. They had no um, problems, of, of course, no harm. The only thing that happened to them was their, bo their bondage, their hands were tied, and those bonds were burnt off. Fire on his people delivers you from bondage that you're under, whether it's religion. We sang that song, religion can bind you into all sorts of traditions and all sorts of stuff that we don't need any longer because we have Christ and he set us free. And all the people said, Amen. Chaff, rubbish, is burned up in our lives. Now, I just want to give you some examples. And uh, I think, uh, who was it? It was Tony who spoke on Wednesday night of um, the Azusa Street revival that took place in L.A., California. Is that annoying you, that... I'll change microphones. It is. Just let me know if it is. And uh, William Seymour, 1906. Can you say 1906? 1906. That's pretty close, Okay. I wasn't born then, but anyway, you might think I was, but I wasn't. And uh, the reports came out that over this particular church, the Azusa Street, fire was burning. There was this light over this particular church. And uh, this, uh, this event, all the stuff that was happening, uh, is said to have birthed most of the Pentecostal revival that, uh, and movement that took place. Now, in this place, eyewitnesses actually saw this, this, this light, and also they could see it streets away, this light burning and glowing, and they also heard these explosions taking place. There, there was fire and explosions. Can you say fire? fire. Explosions. That needs to be our effect when we get out there. We're full of fire, and we just plant bombs everywhere to destroy the enemy. Okay, That needs to be our calling. But it was happening here, and people saw it. And when they heard these uh, explosions, and they saw the fire, they called the fire brigade on a number of occasions because they thought there was a fire over the building. But it wasn't at all. It was the presence of God. Now, why am I saying this? I just read this where this cloud came down in Ezekiel, okay? And there's this, this cloud, flame, fire, all this stuff. And people say, oh, I'll tell God what I think of him when he comes back. He won't say nothing, right? 
they're going to see what God is. And God is enormous and amazing, infinite. We can't possibly explain what he's like. And you know what? He loves us. Yes, he loves us. God, who created the universe, he loves you and I. I can't get over that. And I'll look at me in all my imperfections, and he loves me. All the time, he loves me, and he loves you. And it's something we've got to remember as you're going through all this stuff here. He loves you, and he's called you to make a difference in those people's lives by your testimony. So don't Bible bash them. Testimony is a real important thing. Now, I just want you to think about this. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to continually remind you, when the Baptists owned this building, and that God God gave us this building through the Baptist selling it to us, all right? There was a guy, a Baptist, about here, and he told me that the Holy Ghost fell on him, and I think he fell on the ground. He was overcome by the Holy Spirit right here, okay? Now, I stood about here one night on a Saturday. I've mentioned these things before, and as I was worshipping, I would run back there, turn the music on, and I'd come back and worship. The floor started to rumble. Right? And I opened my eyes and I looked around and I closed it. It started to rumble again. And I thought, oh, it's the speaker over there. No, it wasn't the speaker and it rumbled. If three times it happened. The other night, uh, Mercy, I think it was Mercy, was over there. And as uh, we were worshipping, she heard trumpets blowing. Now, let me tell you this. These things are not happening for nothing. They're starting to whet our appetite. All revivals started off this way. Small groups of people getting together praying, and you know, things started to move. One day, somebody asked me this question. I couldn't really answer it because, you know, I'm a bit slow at times. And uh, they, said, they said to me, you want revival? Are you prepared to pay the price? I thought, what do you mean pay the price for revival? But there is a price to pay. The price is dedication to God, pushing into him, getting up early in the morning, Okay, and praying, even if you don't come to the prayer meeting at home. We need to read our Bibles. We need to press into him. We need to know that he loves us. Oh, he loves us, doesn't he? And sometimes we forget those things. So these things are happening in this church, so praise the God. Praise God. Now, somebody who's just recently passed away, Reinhard Bonnke, you all know him, and uh, he said, Jesus will lift you out of the deepest pit, but he will not lift you out of an easy chair. And I mentioned that last time. And you've got to think about that. If you're slacking God, and none of you are because you're all on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ, but if you are slack, God's not going to lift you out. You need to do something about it. All right? Praise God. He's not going to force you to do anything. It's up to you. Now, I want to look at the next scripture, Revelation chapter 3. I want to look at a slack church. I want to look at what was going on in that church and why were they that, that way. And, you know, Laodicea, you all know this church. And it says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Can you say cold? Hot. Can you say hot? hot? What are you? Hot. That's it. Hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, can you say lukewarm? lukewarm and nothing and neither cold nor hot I will vomit you out of my mouth what a picture this is the Lord speaking next scripture praise God as we look at these things I know you oh here we go it's coming it's coming because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched miserable poor blind naked I counsel you to buy from me gold can you say gold you know that gold is refined in fire He's a fire God, refined in fire, that you may be rich and and white garments, that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Do you see? You see what I'm talking about, don't you? Absolutely. God is on the job. Now, there's various things there. We know that you read articles on this, and they're always headed the lukewarm church. The problem was, as you read into some of these things, apparently they had an aqueduct that ran from outside the city, taking hot spring water into the city. By the time it got there, it was such a long uh, trip along this uh, the, the stone pipe that it got uh, lukewarm, tepid, and it wasn't really useful for anything. And so it was lukewarm, and it resembled the church. They'd become that way. And I've just written down here, they didn't stand up for anything. They didn't stand up for anything. Now, we see our community starting to stand up for a few things. But, you know, for years, the churches, the community didn't stand up for anything. And then we started getting all these bad laws and bad legislation coming through. 
And the last one, the, uh, the abortion bill, 70% of people that surveyed this wanted, didn't want that bill and the politicians pushed it through. So they're no longer representing their people, okay? This is what's happening. But you know, the church for so long has been silent. Uh, Australian Christian lobby, uh, Mark Niles, I, I, I heard him say that this transition bill where people transition from boys to girls and girls to boys um, it got through in Victoria and there was hardly any outcry from the churches. They're silent. I think, what is wrong with you guys? We are the custodians of this earth. We have been told to rule and reign over this place and take dominion and they're not saying anything because, oh, Really, the church and the state are separate. No, they're not. We are there uh, speaking into our politicians. You don't have to be one. You can still speak into them and say, no, this is not on. And all the people said. <laughs> but, you know, if you become like Le Laodicea, you just, if you're indifferent, you'll fall for anything and you think it's okay. It's not okay. All you have to do is do nothing for evil to prevail. Evil just flows. All good people have to do is do nothing and evil will prevail. So we've got to make sure we don't do that. The other thing we can learn from this scripture is mater material positions. You see, they were rich in this particular town. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a blessing from God, okay? And uh, we can get to riches and not care about anyone else. Uh, people are rich and atheists and so forth. So just because someone's rich doesn't mean it's a blessing from God. It could be, and all the people said. You say the person next to you, may God bless you with riches, all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Laodicea was the wealthiest of all the seven cities. It was known for its banking industry. And, uh, but God said, you need to come to me and get gold refined by fire. And the church was full of wealth. The trouble is the Laodiceans could see their money, their goods, all the stuff they had, but they couldn't see the spiritual side. That reminds me of Adelaide. In fact, it reminds me of Australia. We've had it so good for so long. There's India, people dying left, right and centre. We have been spared COVID because our politicians led us in the right direction and we haven't got as many in the population. Let's get this right, like Europe, where it's passed on. There's millions of people there and it's really hard to control. But we have had it, we're blessed as a nation. Yes. Can you say we're blessed as a nation? Yes. We are blessed as a nation. So we've got to realize that, uh, you know, if we start focusing on the blessing, and lots of people have done that, the, uh, the, 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 they just got everything. Three TVs, five cars, you name it. They've got all this stuff. They've got this house, that house, and some other house. We know that the baby boomers are all going overseas. We meet them when we go overseas as well. The difference between a lot of them and us is we know God and they don't. So you try and tell them about God, but you know what they... They just value their trips and money. They don't want to talk about God. That's the world in general, isn't that right? So we've got to have more um, rumbling of the floor. We've got to have more trumpet sounds. We've got to hear the fire of God fall down. When we're speaking to people, we move in the supernatural. Don't be religious because nothing will happen. Move in the supernatural. Expect things to happen when you talk to people. And if they're sick, you've got to pray for them. And all the people said, don't miss opportunities. Pray for me and they, uh, they want you to pray. Because at the end of the day, you find that as God moves, they'll think, how did that happen? You say, I just prayed for you. And let God do what he wants to do. So wealth, luxury, uh, easy life was the, 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 the lot of, of uh, this particular church and the, and the city of Laodicea. It produced confidence, satisfaction. Faction, complacency, I've gotten written down here. And the eternal perspective of life had been forgotten. They were focusing on the natural. They were focusing on the... They were focusing on the... I just did that to make sure you know what I'm talking about. We can all focus on the natural. I've done it, you've done it. Don't tell me you've never done it. You have. We can focus on it to the exclusion of God if we don't watch out so that we mustn't do that thing. Laodicea was proud of its dyeing industry and cloth industry and, uh, and dyeing uh, clothes and this type of thing. And people came far and wide, but Christ said they needed to come to him for robes of righteousness. They were naked. So they were focusing on all the natural stuff. It also prided itself for ointments that they developed for healing of people's eyes and people came uh, in like manner to be healed. But God said, you're blind and you need to come to me so I can open up your eyes. Now, what was their problem? 
I, w I knew you were going to ask me that. All right? Ask the person next to you, what's the problem? We're going to go to the next slide, it's in Luke. This tells you what the problem is. Now, I saw Martin Isles speaking at a conference um, on a YouTube clip, and he summed up this really well, the scripture, about our society in Australia and what's going on. All right, so let's just go through one or two of these things. Still got plenty of time. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and goods. Next slide, as we go on and look at the uh, teaching from here. All right? And then he says... And I will say to my soul, so he's speaking to his soul, soul, speaking to himself, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. Can you say fool? Fool. Oh. You don't want to hear God saying fool, I tell you. Absolutely not. And some people are going to hear that word, you fool. What have you done with your life? He said, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Well, there is a great summary of the problem that was going on. Eleven times the word um, the, uh, uh, you, uh, um, I and my is used in that scripture. It's all about me, not me, but the scripture, I'm not talking about me, all about me and my, it's all about me. Australians have been brought up, it's got to be me. I feel like I'm a man, so I'm a man. I feel like I'm a woman, I'm a woman. Even though they're born a man, how ridiculous. You can't change biology, and all the people said. Science, you cannot change, and all the people said. Amen. What are we doing? And still we call men, women, and so forth, and the radical people want us to, to get rid of men and women, all this type of thing, and use these neutral terms. That's happening in society today. When I pick up the phone and I'm registering Demi and I, they say, is it you and your partner? I said, no, it's me and my wife. Because the connotations of a partner, I'm, she's living with me and not married. I won't let them get away with that. Why should I? I'm a Christian, and all the people said. Marriage is God's idea, not theirs. Partnership was never included in the, in the, in the, in, in the conditions of marriage. It's marriage or not married. And all the people said. This is my hobby horse, I can't help it, sorry. Anyway, praise God, as we see these things. Well, the other thing is, the problem with the farmer was he didn't know himself. Tell the person next to you, the farmer didn't know himself. You know why? Because he didn't understand he's going to die. And life is finite. It is like a vapour. Yet we live as if we're going to live forever. You know, we make decisions that we go, we're not going to live forever in the sense of being in this world. We're going to die. Each and every one of us will die eventually. And all the people said. But we've got eternal life. But the decisions you make have to be built around eternity, not the here and now. Not I, my, I want this, I've got to have this. No, no. We, otherwise, we pour our lives into the silos. That's what this guy did. He poured his life into the silos, and then God said to him, You fool. Instead of pouring his life into God and the eternal aspects that God had provided for him. Now, I just want to uh, jump from here into the next scripture, Isaiah chapter 6. Is this all right? You're still with me? Yes. I want to jump into Isaiah. Write it down if you've got a pencil because you're going to read it at home for homework yourself. And remember, I already mentioned the scriptures. We've got to be not just hearers and enjoyers, but doers and goers. Doers of the word. And back to the fire of God, it says here. And one of the seraphim, you know what the seraphim means? Nick's not allowed to say anything, all right? What's the, what's the meaning of a seraphim? Yeah, he's an angel, but what does the word mean? Nick, no. Fire, the fiery one. Didn't I say that God is the God of fire? His creations, fire. Fire. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm. He doesn't want us to be a little to see in church. He wants us to be on fire, excited for him. And this is seraph seraphim, right? There is an angel, you said, right? But the word means fire, fire one. Flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. 
and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity, sin, evil, whatever it, it means, is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. You know, quite often nowadays when uh, that question is asked, everyone steps back and some sucker forgot to step back and they're the ones out front. Now, it should be the other way. When God says, who will send me, we all run out the front. Send me. I want to go. I want to be part of this. Amen. Because God has given me the ability to preach the gospel. Amen. We need to have on the front, be on the front foot when it comes to preaching the gospel. You're not here. I mean, I've got a house. I've got a car. I've had a great career through my life. I've got a degree, all that stuff. But it's all squat compared to God. God led me through these things. He blessed me for other people to see. But I'm telling you, I didn't pour my life into the silos of my work. I poured my life into God. And I made just as many mistakes, even more than what you have over your life. But I tell you what, God loves us so much. He's picked me up many times, hasn't he, Demi, both of us, and put us on our feet, and we keep walking. And all the people said, fire, fire, send me. The angel touched his mouth, and all this stuff happened. Now, there was a revival in a single community, and uh, it was a place called Abitillary in Wales, Abitillary in Wales, and uh, it was a, a booming commercial centre. I want you to listen to this, a booming commercial centre, and families flocked to find work in the coal pits in that particular time during the Welsh Revival, and churches were already thriving, um, but revival hit the place like a hurricane. Bang! So churches were already growing, but revival struck the place. And in less than 10 weeks, no fewer than 3,000 people made commitment to God and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people. That reminds me of the day of Pentecost. Remember? 3,000 people. We couldn't fit them in here. Okay? We'd have to have it open air. That's why perhaps God gave us this, so we can have meetings out there. Okay, 3,000 people. Apparently it was a miracle because it was over 10% of the population, which was uh, almost unheard of during this time. So today I've asked a special guest. He is a, uh, an enthusiastic reporter, and he comes from the South Wales Gazette all the way over to tell us exactly what resulted from this revival. So I'm getting Colin to come up now, and he's our reporter for today. today. Reporting. The revival has been the absorbing theme of thought and discussion in the media. Before it was war, the state of trade, ordinary and extraordinary political topics, and even football. Yeah. <laughs> and there have been put into the shade with what's going on. Drunkards have been saved. Publicans have lost their businesses. Conduct on streets have elevated and the police and the magistrates have had their quieter times. The bottom of the pits in the coal mines have been utilised as centres for prayer and praise meetings and there has been general rising of the standards of public life. The revival still continues to monopolise general attention in the press. Almost everybody is talking about it, thinking about it, our working in the, sorry, thinking about it or working in its interests and the movement does not seem to flag at all. Converts are being made mightily and the enthusiasm is intensifying and spreading. The chapel was packed in the afternoon and there was a warmer feeling 
in the assembly. As miners came in, probably this was chiefly due to the spirit which accompanied them. The workers with black faces, working clothes on and boxes and jacks imparted what they dropped into the meeting on their way home and sang in a spirited manner the songs of the revival, creating fever, sorry, fervor, <laughs> which did not flag during the remainder of the meeting. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Here, see, something happened. <laughs> Abertillary was the place. Can you imagine down the bottom of the mines, there they are mining away and they've got coal dust all over them and they're singing choruses, singing songs to God. And they, they do their shift and they come out of there and they don't go home and watch telly, days of our lives and all that rubbish that's on nowadays. They come along to chapel and they come into the meeting, there's already a meeting going, and they bring in the spirit of warmth, of enthusiasm, and the fire burns even more. You see, that's why we need to come to church. We need to come together. No wonder the scripture says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves to, uh, uh, together, because if you do, you will stay home with the devil, and he will speak into your life, and you will be influenced by the things of this world. You might kill me afterwards for preaching this way, but I'm telling you, I know I've done it. I've been there. I know what happens. If you try and not go to church and you don't value uh, your fellowship, you know, this is where it's all happening. And when you go home, your home is where it's all happening. And when you go to work, that is where it's all happening. You are the church. Wherever you are, it's all happening. And all the people said, fire! The fire God is inside of you. He wants to touch those people who don't know. This revival that took place, the newspapers, they were all talking about it. They're enthusiastic. You know, the long-term consequences of this revival, I've written down here, within a decade, Korea, India, France, uh, Madagascar, and a dozen other countries' uh, movements were influenced by the revival in Wales, and it touched many thousands, if not millions of people. Dare it happen again? Don't you understand that it could happen here or any church? I don't care which church it starts, but it could happen here. Are we hungry enough for the things of God? Are we prepared to pay the price? Thank you, Jesus, for moving upon us. You know, uh, Reinhard Bonnke, 1967, he started South Africa, amazing stuff. And he did his farewell crusade in 2017. I've said these things before. Do you know that Reinhard Bonnke, he wasn't God's first choice? There were two other guys before him that God called. And I heard Reinhard Bonnke give this testimony. And the story is astounding. Eventually, Reinhard Bonnke goes and God calls him. Through a miracle, he gets to this place where this guy was going to place his mantle upon Reinhard Bonnke. And he, here's the story. These two other guys, they'd, reject, they'd refused God's call. But look what happened when Reinhard Bonnke stepped into God's call. You see, you may think you're no good and you, you can't do it and you're not the best and it's never going to happen. It's not about you. It's about God. He gives you the strength. He gives you the talent. If you're lacking in any area, he will make up for it and flow through you. It's in his interest for his glory to make you appear as if you're confident, to speak out. And even if you get tongue-tied, he will anoint your words and they will touch people. Not just what you say. God gives you the anointing upon your words and all the people said. Amen. Reinhard Bonnke, when he first started off, he thought he'd uh, set up a Bible college. And he thought, oh, perhaps nobody's going to apply. But the first thing he did, he got 50,000 applicants for attendance at this Bible uh, college. And he soon woke up that Reinhard Bonnke, uh, that, God, that people wanted God. Okay? Now, you may think they don't want God, but more and more, as things are happening in this world, they'll want God. I'm telling you, they'll be looking for answers. They may not necessarily think it's God, but you're the God agent. You're out there and you need to declare your testimony of what God is doing. In fact, you need to pray for their kids or their arm or their leg. Whatever's wrong, you need to pray like Heather was saying. Pray for them. Guess what? They may get healed to the glory of God. So don't become a big shot healing evangelist. You just let God get the glory, not you. And you go on to the next person. You keep praying for them and believing and you'll see things happening. 
So he got this building, and he had to pay a certain amount of money per week, and he had nothing. So he prayed and prayed and prayed, and one day the Holy Ghost spoke to him, and he said, Reinhard, do you want me to give you a million dollars? Now, if the Holy Spirit said that to me, <coughs> if God said, do you want a million dollars? You know what Reinhard Bonnke said? Some of you know the story. He said, no, Lord, and tears came in his eyes, and his nose started running, and he got emotion. He says, I don't want a million dollars. I want a million souls. Okay? I would have said a million dollars, but anyway, <laughs> a million souls. No, I wouldn't. You know what I'm saying. Quite often we'd say, yeah, I'll have a million dollars. A million souls. And God moved upon that, and uh, of course, incredible things happened. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he got this saying that you've heard. He said uh, to him, you will plunder hell and populate heaven for Calvary's sake. A direct calling from God. I'd like to speak to you today, and as I was reading this and studying it, it was like God said, I need to speak that over you, right now. The Holy Spirit's saying to you here today, you people, me, all of us, you will plunder hell and populate heaven for Calvary's sake. Amen. God has called you for a purpose, not just to come to this church. This, is, this church is nothing. You are everything. And we are the church in the marketplace. Come on, guys. You've got something special to give those people out there, and it's really important. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Reinhard Bonnke in Germany had organized this great uh, um, uh, um, thing, that, a stadium for uh, uh, preaching the gospel, and it was in Germany. You may not know this, but in Germany they've got this law. It's an, uh, an, an, an archaic law that speaking in tongues is outlawed. So if you, get, if you speak in tongues in public, they arrest you and can put you in jail. So he's there and, uh, in this meeting, and people were, uh, came along and filled up the stadium, and they were weeping and crying as he preached and as he gave them the gospel. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to him as he was speaking to these people, and the Holy Spirit said, tomorrow, uh, uh, said to him, tomorrow, um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to be coming, and you're going to preach on it. And Reinhard thought, I'm not preaching on it. I'll get arrested, you know, because speak in tongues and so forth. And uh, so... Anyway, God said to him, he would pour out his last spirit in the last days. In other, in other words, Reinhard, you just do what I'm telling you to do. Well, he told people in the stadium what was going to take place, that tomorrow he was going to preach on the Holy Spirit. And the next day, you can imagine, there was a capacity crowd. They couldn't get in, full of people. But some archbishop or an archbishop came from one of the uh, established churches. And so Reinhard's uh, close advice said, you better not talk about speaking in tongues because if you do, we're in big trouble. So Reinhard, he, I remember his testimony, he said he got up and he preached. He preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But he forgot to say anything about tongues. He didn't do it willfully. And he said, even though he forgot to, to say anything about speaking in tongues, the Holy Spirit didn't care, God didn't care. Because next thing, as he's preaching, and he stopped preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he saw this wave appear on the left hand of the stadium, a big wave, and it swept right through all the people who were in that place, and they all were speaking in tongues. So God doesn't care. At the end of the day, tongues comes from God. And Jesus said it would be one of the signs. So don't put it down. You need everything that God said would flow from you. Now, the amazing thing is I went over to see Steve Penny in the Hillsong Conference. Am I, can I keep going? Are you sleeping or no? You're not sleeping? Steve Penny is a pastor. <clears throat> and there we are. We're in a part of the teaching that they had. There was hundreds of people there. He spoke on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. There was Salvation Army, every religion you can think, Baptist, you know. There's a difference between the Baptists, those who believe in tongues, those who don't. And there were all these people were in there, and there were all sorts of religions and then right at the end, he said, who would like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues? I thought, this would be interesting. These won't go forward. Hundreds of people went forward. I was shocked. And they stood out in front of this, this uh, platform. And Steve Penny prayed for them. And he just goes, well, he prays for them. And the whole lot, most of them, started speaking in tongues as God came upon them. God has his ways. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is softening the hearts of the people for you to speak to them. And uh, absolutely uh, amazing. Reinhardt screamed out. He said, my God, is this possible? As he saw this wave going across and through this stadium. We'll just look at the next slide and we're finished, okay? Otherwise, I'll be talking all day and all the chicken will get cold. So praise God. Here we are. Relationships 
Relationships, relationships. If you don't think of anything, think of the three R's. All right? You like that? Three R's? Relationship, relationship with God. You've got to work on that. It's like a marriage. Demi and I have to work on our marriage. We've been married for how long? 48, uh, 60 years. 46. Oh, 46 years. I thought, where? I thought, 60 years. Where were the years gone? 46 years we've been married. Now, we, we have a date night once a week. But we have a date night. We have to have a date night so we go out. Otherwise, we, you know, I'm running here. Demi's running there. We're seeing this person, that person doing this. We have a date night. We have to work on our marriage after all this time. You've got to work on your relationship with the Lord. And all the people said, it doesn't just come naturally. He doesn't want it naturally. He wants you to connect in the spirit, which means you've got to draw closer to him. Hunger and thirst for the things of God. Not the doers and the goers. Well, we, I mean, we need to be doers and goers of, for the word. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, it needs to be what we go by. And the fire will be your portion. Hallelujah. You're going to walk. Listen, you're going to go through the furnace of adversary, all of you. You've most really already been through it. But there's always somebody in the fire with you. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. He will never let you go. Sometimes you lose vision and sight of him, but he's never gone. He's always there and he's holding you up and he will bring uh, everything to conclusion in your life. Would you like to stand? I'm going to finish there because we ran out of time 10 minutes ago. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And we look to him. Thank you, Father. And I know that as I was seeking God, I said, Lord, what? <laughs> Prayer. If you feel like you want more of God, if you want more of God, I want you to come out. We're going to pray for you. If you want more of God, there may be some prophetic flows out of that as well. Something will flow if you come out. So I encourage you to come out. If you want to be healed, I encourage you to come